You're listening to a message from Gateway Church Geelong. We hope it blesses you. For more information about Gateway, visit gc.org.au. Good morning, Gateway Church. It's so great to be here with you this morning. We are going to come around the Word of God, around God's furious love, His beautiful love that is intentional, that is full of comfort, peace and affection, full of energy. That is God's furious love towards His people this morning, all mankind. All humanity, He loves you this morning. And as I've been walking this week, because you know that I actually have been walking, I've got proof of it. But you know, in my morning walks, I've been so reminded just at these incredible uh, intentions and thoughts that God has had towards me, that God has had towards you. But in particular, I've just had these moments of being so thankful to God. So thankful to God, to every single person, whether it be family, whether it be uh, health workers, professionals, teachers online. I have just been so thankful for the incredible people from God that He has put into my corner. God is in your corner this morning. Do you hear me? God has supplied people to come into your corner to equip you, to help you, to comfort you, to encourage you this morning. God is in your corner with His incredible love towards you. God is in your corner and you can see Him. You can see God through the people that He has sent to you to encourage you, to equip you, to support you and to assist you because that's the love of our God. I've got this incredible story this morning from Brennan Manning again, the same man that I spoke about two weeks ago. But back in the late 1960s, Brennan Manning was teaching at the university in Iho, and there was a student on campus who by society standards would have been called unattractive. He was short. He was extremely obese. He he had a lisp and he had a terrible case of acne and his hair was so overgrown it was sticking in all four directions at once. His consistent uniform of the day consisted of a standard t-shirt that hadn't been washed in months and jeans unkept and of course no shoes. In all of Brennan Manning's days, he had never met anybody with such low self-esteem. His name was Larry, Larry Mullaney. And Larry actually said that every time he looked at himself in the mirror each morning, that he would spit at his reflection. Of course, no campus girl wanted to date him and no fraternity wanted him as a pledge. And Brennan Manning said that this one day he walked into his office and said with his lisp evident, "Ah, you're a new face on campus. Well, my name is Larry, Larry Mullaney, and I'm agnostic, meaning there can be nothing known to the existence of God. He had no evidence to support that there was a God. And the story I'm about to tell you is one at Christmas time and what Larry got for Christmas. Christmas came along for Larry Mullaney and he found himself back with his parents in Rhode Island in Providence. Larry's father is a typical lace curtain Irishman, meaning he was well off and came from a family of money. And even on the hottest day in summer, his father would never ever come to the dinner table without a shirt, a tie and a suit. He would never allow his sideburns to grow to the top of his ears and he would always speak in a low, subdued voice. Well, Larry comes to dinner that first night, smelling like a billy goat. He and his father have the usual number of quarrels and banter and reconciliations and thus begins a typical vacation in the Maloney home. Several nights later, Larry tells his father that he's got to get back to school the next day. And I love the words of his father. What time, son? And Larry says, six o'clock, dad. And his dad says, well, I'll 
ride the bus with you. The next morning, the father and son rode the bus in silence. And as they get off the bus, as Larry has to catch a second one to get to the airport, directly across the street are six men men standing under an awning. All men who work in the same textile factory as Larry's father. And they begin making loud and degrading remarks like, oink, oink, look at that fat pig. I tell you, if that pig was my kid, I would hide him in the basement. I'd be so embarrassed. Another one said, I wouldn't know if he's on foot or on horseback. Hey, pig, give us your best oink. These brutal, aggressive acts continued. And Larry Mullaney told Brennan Manning that in that moment, for the first time in his life, his father reached out to him, embraced him, kissed him on the lips, and in that moment said to him, Larry, if your mother and I live to be 200 years old, that wouldn't be long enough to thank God for the gift he gave us in you. I'm so proud of you, my son. Larry, I'm just so proud of you. Brennan Manning said it would be hard to describe in words. The transformation that took place in the life of Larry Mullaney, but this is what Brennan Manning could see. Larry came back to school and remained a hippie, but he cleaned up the best he could. Miracle of miracles, Larry began to dating a girl and top it off, he became the president of one of the fraternities. And by the way, he was the first student in the history of the university to graduate with a 4.2 grade point average, well above average grades. Larry Mullaney had a brilliant mind. And Brennan Manning said, Larry came to my office this one day and said, would you tell me about this man, Jesus? And for the next six weeks, Brennan was able to share with Larry what the Holy Spirit had revealed to him about Jesus Christ. And at the end of those six weeks, Larry said, okay, I want to receive Jesus. In June 14, 1974, Larry Mullaney was ordained a minister. And for the past 20 years, he's been a missionary in South America, a man who was totally sold out by Jesus Christ. Do you know why? It wasn't because of the six weeks sitting in Brennan Manning's office while he talked about Jesus. No, it was because of a day long ago during a Christmas vacation standing at a bus stop when his lace curtain Irish father healed him. Yes, his father healed him. His father had the guts to get out of the foxhole and choose the high road of blessing in the face of cursing and taunts. His father looked deeply into his son's eyes, saw the good in Larry Mullaney that Larry couldn't see for himself, affirmed with his furious love for his son and changed the whole direction of his son's life. Furious love. What is furious love? Furious love describes an incredible intensity and energy that goes beyond the bounds of what we know love to be and everything about what God's love is. The love of Christ this morning embraces us all without exception. John 15.3 puts it like this, no one has greater love No one has shown stronger affection than to lay down, give up his own life for his friends. And this is exactly what Larry's father did. 
Larry is a vote called for who he is, not for who he is not. And the outcome is this inner healing of his heart and the incredible touch of affirmation and affection from his father. Affirmation that healed furious love that set Larry's life free. We need to learn how to receive healing. We need to learn how to embrace what the Father has already made possible for us. Every burden was taken upon the cross so that you could understand, so that you could receive healing in your life. And we see this in the story, in the bitter waters of Marah. You know this is one of my favorite stories. Exodus chapter 15, verses 22 to 27. Then Moses led the people of Israel away from the Red Sea and they find themselves now in the desert for three days. And they've been traveling without any water for three days. You know, the children of Israel in this moment, they were away from trauma, but they still carried the pain. You can be away from trauma, but still carry the pain and bring that pain to a crisis point like a desert and no water after three days and trauma explodes at a crisis point. In verse 23, it says, when they came to the oasis of Marah, the water was too bitter to drink. So they called the place Marah, which means bitter. This was not the only reaction logically that the children of Israel could have had going on what God had just did. He had just rescued them. He had just parted the Red Sea for them and allowed them to walk on dry ground. But trauma needs to receive healing to create a whole new foundation where healthy relationships, trust can be built and cultivated. It says in verse 24, then the people complained and turned against Moses. What are we going to drink? We need water, Moses, they demanded. You see, crisis in our present teaches us what we need to look back at so that we can understand in our present what is troubling us. It is here where we learn who to cry out to, not to who to cry at. It says in verse 25, so Moses cried out to the Lord for help and the Lord provided. He revealed to him, he showed to him a piece of wood. And as Moses picked up this provision and threw that wood into the water, in that moment, those waters that were bitter were made sweet enough to drink and bring refreshing. You see, we need to learn. Can we learn how to cry out to God when we are in pain? He will show us how to heal. He will bring the provision to our lives. You see, the root of that bitterness for the children of Israel and mistrust, it ran deep within their hearts and their minds and their history. But God made bitter water sweet. Do you hear this morning? Hear me this morning. God makes bitter waters sweet. After leaving Marah, it says in verse 27, look at this scripture. The Israelites traveled on to the oasis of Elim, where they found not one spring, but 12 springs and 70 palm trees. Refreshing protection. That is the God, our Lord, who provides. And they camped there besides the water. This is not just one piece of wood anymore to make one spring sweet again. This was 12 springs of water. This was refreshing and protection that they could stay by, live by and camp by to sustain them. God wants to sustain your healing this morning. He wants to sustain your sweetness this morning. 
Psalm 60 says it like this, verse 10. Have you really rejected us, refusing to fight our battles, God? But give us a father's help when we face our enemies. For to trust in any man is an empty hope. But with God's help, Hear me this morning, church, with God's help, we will fight like heroes and he will trample down our every single foe. Healing is God's response to a crisis in the life of another person. Let me say that again. Healing is God's response to a crisis in the life of another person. Jeremiah 31 says it beautifully like this. The Lord appeared from of old to me saying, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, have I drawn you and continued my faithfulness to you. His love is continual healing. His healing seeks you out to comfort you to affirm you and to put you onto a solid foundation again. In Luke 19, we see this incredible story of Zacchaeus, the tax collector. It says in verse 19, uh, verse 1, sorry, Jesus entered Jericho and Jesus was just passing through and a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was wealthy. You know, Zacchaeus was a man who had reached the top of his profession, but he was the most hated man as a tax collector in his district. Nobody was asking him for a relationship and nobody was certainly asking him over for dinner. But Zacchaeus wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. Zacchaeus was an outcast. What had he had heard? What is it that he'd heard about Jesus that that day was about to go against a crowd that hated him just so that he could see Jesus? It says in verse 5, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up to Zacchaeus and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and he welcomed Jesus gladly. When an Orthodox Jew, which Jesus was, says, I want to have dinner with you. It's actually saying, I want to enter into friendship with you. All the people, verse 7, saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be this guest of a sinner. You see, everyone looked on the outside of Zacchaeus, his flesh, he was a traitor and outcast, but Jesus looked at him, really looked at his heart and believed in what he could be. So invited himself to have dinner with him, invited himself to have friendship with Zacchaeus. Like the well at Marah, waters that were stagnant, internal pieces of Zacchaeus' heart that had become dried up and bitter suddenly began to rise with expectancy of life. And against everyone's else thoughts and opinions, Zacchaeus opened up his heart receiving fresh living water that was coming from Jesus. Bitter feelings, thoughts becoming and changing sweet to the point that receiving such a magnitude of healing caused caused God's goodness to rise within the heart of Zacchaeus and burst forth with living water of generosity and forgiveness to those around him. It says in verse 8, but Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, 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 here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay four times the amount back. This is a tax collector. He's going to pay them back four times the amount. 
And Jesus said to him, Zacchaeus, today salvation has come to your house because this man too, Jesus said, is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save the lost. You know, to believe in a person is to see the good in them that they cannot see for themselves and to repeat in spite of appearances to the contrary. It's so easy to see people's choices, people's lifestyles, and be so consumed with our perception that we move past the inner struggle of their pain that exists in their heart. Let's not move too quickly. Let us see their hearts. You know, like a tree with its trunk, with its roots, its branches, with leaves, people concentrate only on what they see. Those leaves, those branches, they concentrate only on what they can see and not what they know. They see the leaves only, the behaviors, the choices, and not why those decisions in that individual's lives were made. Too quick to judge and not slow enough to take the time to listen to where the root of that pain actually comes from. We deal with them from the fruit of the tree rather than seek the knowledge to the root of their pain. Let me say that again. We deal with them from the fruit of the tree that we can see rather than to pause to seek the knowledge from a God who knows to see what the root of their pain is. To face pain is confrontational. I had a friend for many years that would never, ever look in a mirror because of the incredible pain that the reflection actually brought to her life. So what happens in these moments is that we ignore the pain. We shove the shame away in silence under lock and key, and we try to heal ourselves, furthering our pain. But too often we don't allow ourselves to receive healing that comes from a God that has furious love towards you and I. And in order we move ourselves away from God, we can move ourselves away from our plan, His plan of perfect love for our lives. And then we struggle. We find ourselves in this place of struggle to find where are we with God? Where are we at with God? God, where do you find yourself today? Is it like Larry hearing the condemnation, hearing the taunts, not only of his own thoughts, but the men across the street for him? Do we believe those words or like Larry, do we listen to the words of our Father that comes with affection, that comes with healing and wholeness with love? words of a father. Romans 8.1 says this, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. No more condemning words can have any authority because of the authority of Jesus Christ in your life who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit, you walk according to the Spirit of God because it is the Spirit of God that has made your heart His home this morning. Larry, the children of Israel, Zacchaeus were burdened by condemnations, trapped until the words of their father freed and healed them and set them free. This is the words of Jesus Christ. He is truth. He loves you this morning. Which is louder in your heart today? Whose words will you believe? Which is louder? Is it those thoughts of anger? Is it those thoughts of pain? Or is it the words of truth and love and mercy and compassion that come through Jesus Christ? Whose words? Will you believe this morning? 
1 John 4.10 says this beautiful scripture. This is love. He loved us long before we loved Him. It was His love. It wasn't our love. It was His. He proved it by sending His Son to be the pleasing, sacrificial offering to take away our sins, our burdens, our traumas. This morning, He is your road in your wilderness. Jesus is your stream in your desert. He is the sweetness to the bitterness that is lodged in your heart this morning. Jesus is in your corner and your corner is filled with love. You know what? I love what Romans 10.9 says this morning. It says this, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. It's as simple as that. If you believe, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus, you are Lord this morning and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You know what the words of Jesus say today? You will be saved. You will be rescued. You will be opening yourself to the love of our Father. And it says in Ephesians 3, 17, this is what his love's like. It is this morning, may Christ through your faith. That means your trust in Jesus. Let it dwell. Let it make his permanent home in your hearts. May you be rooted deep in love and found securely on love that you may have the power and be strong and apprehend and grasp with all the church the experience of the love of our Saviour. What is the breadth, the length and the height and the depth of it? I don't know where you find yourself in this place today, but I want you to know that Jesus loves you, that Jesus wants to make your heart his home, that you can feel his love, that you are surrounded by words of affirmation and affection. He is in your corner this morning. And if you say to me, Pastor Naomi, I don't know who Jesus is, but I need to be rescued and I need the love of a saviour. I need words of affirmation where there has been incredible taunts that have brought bitterness to my heart. Will you show me? Will you lead me to this saviour? we're going to do exactly what this verse says. And as a church right now, everybody is praying this prayer. It's a prayer to ask Jesus to come into your heart that just like Zacchaeus, you can have relationship with Jesus Christ. I want us to pray together. If every head could be bowed and every eye could be closed and together you can pray this prayer along with me. Dear Jesus, We declare this morning that Jesus, you are Lord. We believe you, God, that you raised Jesus from the dead. And because of this, because of you, Jesus, I am saved. Amen. If you have prayed this prayer for the very first time, you know what this means? You know what the truth is? Jesus is now in your heart. He has made your heart his home. You can walk daily with the fellowship, with the words, relationship with Jesus Christ. And we don't want to just keep you in this place. We want to be able to give you access to a Bible where you can hear his words. We want to give you incredible worship that you can listen to. We want to make everything available that you don't have to walk this journey out alone, but you walk it out with the church of Jesus Christ. And that's us today. So you can go to gc.org.au forward slash first steps, and that will give you everything you need to know about your journey with God.